So I've been meaning to make this video for a while and uh, we cannot do a, a big extensive history of wrestling here because it, that's just too much. As far as we know, it is absolutely the oldest combat sport. Um, and it's not just a sport, right? It, it also flows into the realm of you know, self-defense and street fighting, etc. And so I, I want to do a, a kind of a quick and dirty lowdown of kind of where, where uh, wrestling comes from. And then I want to speak a little bit about uh, catch and professional wrestling and where we're going from there. And so, right, if we start off with our brief history of wrestling, right, what does it even mean to wrestle? Well, to wrestle comes from an old Proto-Germanic word, you know, rest, uh, which means to twist or wrench, right? So you're, you know, figuratively speaking and quite often literally speaking, you're twisting somebody up. And uh, just because the word grappling gets thrown around a lot, it's just an alternate word. Um, the word grapple actually refers to a hook. Right, and it means to hook, and it seems to go back to, um, you know, the the era of the high seas, and people would hook their ships onto, uh, you know, onto dock so that they could actually uh, uh, not lose their ship to the tide. And so, okay, so those are common terms. Uh, I've I've actually seen people uh, complain and moan about wrestling versus grappling, whatever. Right, it's. That's not terminology we need to get hung up on too much. Yes, uh, a hook is different than twisting, but being as that we're using these semi-figuratively, um, it, it, it works, right? And, and they're, they're both important terms. They both do something similar. They both do something different. Whatever you want to call it, wrestling, grappling, it's fine. All right, so uh, ancient wrestling. You know, a lot of it we don't know exactly what it looks like uh, because all we have are cave paintings and uh, carved reliefs and whatnot. But for sure, we can say at least 15,000 years goes back to some cave paintings. And obviously, uh, we have art from the Egyptian era, the Babylonian era, um, the, you know, depicting wrestling. And I mean, you can see all sorts of techniques that are still in use today. Uh, done back then. We have no real idea uh, for the most part uh, what what rules were and, and what was allowed and what was not allowed. So there's not much to be said there other than the fact that people have been wrestling for as long as there have been people. Now if we come into kind of the, the Middle Ages, the medieval period, right, and this is East and West. This is not this is not just you know American wrestling, right? We come into the medieval period. I, I want to bring up um, Fiore. So Fiore is a sword master from the 1400s, uh, even late 1300s, and uh, his book from roughly about 1410, he outlines that, uh, one, he, he kind of puts wrestling in the forefront, and he outlines that there's wrestling for play and there's wrestling in earnest. Now that's the translation, and I don't speak medieval Italian, uh, so I'm taking the translator's word for it, but essentially in earnest just means serious wrestling, right? You have play wrestling and serious wrestling. And one of the things that we do see is when you start getting into some of these wrestling traditions that are written down during these periods, when you see kind of the folk styles, the sport styles of wrestling, the competition styles of wrestling, they're mostly just takedown wrestling and oftentimes they're forms of uh, like backhold wrestling. And to even a degree, you'll see like uh, jacket wrestling and uh, belt wrestling, right? Uh, Glima uh, has at least one rule set with a belt um, or a couple of belts. Um, and we see jacket wrestling, obviously, you know, Japanese and Chinese wrestling, Mongolian wrestling are all jacket based, but we see that in uh, Neo-German Ringen, we see it in Irish Collar and Elbow, we see it in French Goren. Uh, jacket wrestling was totally a thing kind of across the globe. Lo and behold, people wear clothing, so you know, kind of makes some sense. And uh, same thing with the belts, right? People wear gear, people wear belts, whether you're talking armor or you're talking just strapping things to them because maybe pockets weren't invented yet, whatever. Um, reasonable enough proxy besides people just like to do things and have fun and go this seems like a good idea might as well do that um, and of course we do see some kind of freestyle wrestling if you look at uh, like Pedro Monte's work uh, from 1509 uh, sorry 1510 was when it was published but he died in 1509 so he wrote it you know before then uh, he, he kind of details some of the different 
uh, wrestling temperaments that you see. And he's very big on you start with wrestling and then you move into your weapons work. And he details out some of how, oh, these guys fall when they, you know, when they do takedowns and, you know, uh, these guys like to kick with it. And, you know, that's where kind of like, like you look at purring, shin kicking. Uh, it's kind of like backhold wrestling plus shin kicking. Uh, <laughs> kind of brutal, but, you know, it, it is what it is. And so what we're generally seeing in the medieval period, right, and you go to, like, you look at Japanese wrestling and, uh, and, and, and uh, traditional grappling systems, you look at Chinese traditional grappling systems, um, you know, you look at Italian and German traditional grappling systems, most of these are takedown oriented, and if they do involve any kind of uh, twisting of the joints or strangles or anything like that, they're often very quick, they're kind of, uh, you know, either standing or kind of immediately upon takedown kind of things. Often you can look at them as grip and rips and not necessarily subdual holds. Uh, so what you're seeing there, and that's what Fiore would call wrestling in earnest, he shows a lot of uh, you know, bar holds, key locks, things like that uh, in, in his system. And his, I mean, he involves eye gouging and knees to the groin in his wrestling in earnest, which I believe in general were not in the rules in most back hold styles. And so when you look at this, there was starting to be this kind of division of this is how you do it in play and then this is how you enhance those skills with um, with joint manipulation and striking on top of it, right? You look at the, the atemi in uh, Japanese styles and even uh, Chinese chin na practice in, in their traditional martial arts. Chin na is not just twisting the joints, it's also takedowns and uh, vital point striking. So, you know, why would all of this be in the first place? Well, one, you're going to be looking at the fact that wrestling is kind of like the natural dominance game. Like every animal has a form of wrestling and it's usually a non-lethal form of combat that is meant to just prove who's the big dog in the pile. That's how dominance games work. And when you start translating that into warfare where things do become lethal, um, you know, armored combat and whatnot, oftentimes it is you are putting a guy down uh, long enough to either either stop him from drawing a weapon, stop him from taking your weapon, or long enough to draw your own weapon or pick your weapon up, whatever. Uh, so then you can shank him. And so when we're looking at this stuff, all of a sudden, like the play wrestling stays the dominance game, and the the serious wrestling starts becoming ways to um, to disable opponent at least long enough to get to your weapon and take them out. And then later, of course, that becomes arresting and subduing because as time progresses and, and people civilize, they become less and less interested in killing each other and more and more interested in the dominance games. At least that seems to be the way it is. Now, all right, so we take all of that, right? It's very old. Uh, we start seeing a bifurcation between play and serious wrestling. We have equipped and non-equipped wrestling. All right, so and then we get to the modern era where we talk about catch and professional wrestling and, you know, BJJ and modern grappling, uh, you know, uh, Olympic wrestling, all that kind of stuff. There's some interesting stuff there. So um, let's change the board and, and talk about that just a little bit. OK, so let's talk a little bit about where catch wrestling comes from. So catch wrestling kind of became a thing in 1870 when the first catch as catch can rules were drafted up by J.G. Chambers. Also the guy that gave us Queensbury Rules Boxing. He's kind of the guy that, for, from my perspective, ruined boxing, but then gave us catch, which is the grappling that I love. And so the idea originally of catch as catch can was we're talking about an era of industrialization and people actually starting to be able to move between uh, locales, being able to move between counties and whatnot. And you start to have these big kind of public fairs and, uh, and people are able to kind of compete against one another. Well, you have all of these uh, different local styles of grappling from all over the place have slightly different rule sets and slightly different conventions. And Chambers comes up with the idea, hey, let's, let's have a competition where we can put all of these guys together and make them compete against each other. Let's draft a rule set that is uh, open enough to allow all of their styles to blend together. It was the MMA of grappling. It's what catch was. It wasn't a style. It was actually just a competition format. And 
So the idea of catch as catch can is right, catch any hold any way you can. And uh, catch wrestling kind of became this, this, this really uh, cool platform that started to take on a life of its own and became a style of its own. And one of the things that we see, um, it, you know, if you look at uh, uh, like documentaries like uh, Catch the Hold Not Taken, one of the things that they, they, they talk about is that in, uh, in the mining camps and whatnot, these catch wrestlers preferred doing submissions, right? And the submissions in catch wrestling mostly seem to come from Lancashire and some of these maybe older styles of more serious wrestling, things that were passed down. Um, they seem to prefer uh, submission holds because the submission holds provided a more definitive win for them. But in the fairs, in the public displays, the general public was a little bit more prudish and thought that some of that was too barbaric, too violent. And so they tended to use their, their, their submission holds, their punishing holds, as just a move to get a guy flipped over on his back so they could pin him. So in catch, we give just about equal weight to pins and submissions. And a lot of it is this kind of dual nature of the thing. So for the fighters, it's submissions. For the crowds, it's pins. But that's kind of what we're looking at. Now, you may know that, you know, Catch didn't initially allow uh, strangleholds. It was seen as barbaric. Obviously, that changed. Um, but there, you know, th there was a little something there. Well, then we had this cool thing that happened in kind of like the, the 1890s, early 1900s, something like that. Uh, I don't have my notes right off hand, so I could be a little early on this. But uh, All In Wrestling starts coming in uh, right at the beginning of the 20th century. Now, All In Wrestling was, hey, let's let boxers compete too. Because up until this point, you know, up until 1867, boxers were allowed to do throws. They weren't allowed to hold and hit. And so you still have old, you know, boxers from the old camp and whatnot. And so they go, all right, so let's do it where you can hit the body, but you can't, you can't punch the face uh, with a closed fist. Uh, you can't kick because the English don't like kicking because maybe that turns you French or something, whatever. Um, I think it actually probably has more to do with the fact that uh, purring was seen as, as overly barbaric and they probably wanted to discourage uh, purring. So, in, in that case, and that's a hypothesis, I don't really have any documentation to prove that. So in All In Wrestling, they started allowing limited striking and the full rules of catch as catch can wrestling. And that gave us the platform for what would become pro wrestling. Well, the problem is that with All In Wrestling, you also started getting into the realm of people fixing fights. They figured out they could make more money if the fights were predetermined, you know, insider betting and all of that. And with that, because people want to see bigger, bigger shows and every, every show has to one up the next one, the, the shows got less and less technical and more and more brutal to the point where they were actually bringing in foreign objects and whatnot, just like we see in hardcore wrestling today. And it was basically on its way out, getting, getting banned in certain locations and whatnot. And it's just like we saw with the UFC early on. And then uh, Admiral Lord Mount Evans comes in and says, well, hey, I think we can solve this. And he creates a more stringent rule set, um, slightly, slightly better defined uh, than the simpler rule set of all in wrestling. And it allowed them to kind of start cleaning it up and making money again on it. And the Lord, uh, Admiral Lord Mount Evans rules, which started in 1952, became widely adopted. And that's kind of what gave us the platform for modern professional wrestling. Now, modern professional wrestling doesn't stick exclusively to these. And a lot of that has to do with um, uh, foreign influence, uh, specifically Japanese wrestling influence, but others as well. Uh, and the, the rule sets change. And now there's not really a clear defined rule set because it's just a show and people just have kind of a vague idea of it's wrestling, it's not kickboxing, it's not MMA, and so on. And so that's kind of how we get to pro wrestling. But I mentioned Japan, right? So all in wrestling gets really popular all the way up through the 1930s. At this point, uh, a lot of Japanese folks were bringing their uh, jujitsu and, and even judo over here to the West. And the West was bringing wrestling to Japan. And Japan absolutely fell in love with wrestling. The West fell in love with judo. And so, I mean, it, Kedge and Judo are, uh, and, and Japanese Jiu-Jitsu in, in general, are very much intertwined and have been for a century. 
And so in, uh, in Japanese wrestling, you get to the 1970s and they want to actually do shoot matches. Now keep in mind, right, a lot of Japanese wrestlers, as Josh Barnett has talked about this, Japanese wrestlers often, uh, they really prize training in real martial arts and not just doing the show, right? So a lot of them are actually trained in real martial arts, not just performance. And even a lot of old American wrestlers and old British wrestlers were trained in traditional, actual like combat, you know, catch wrestling, and uh, that's kind of gone away in the modern era. But the fact that, that what we see with the shoot wrestling thing is these guys wanted to do it for real. And so sometimes shoot matches would get mixed in uh, with works. Fine, whatever, right? But that bred into competitions that were full on shoot fighting, right? And there's various shoot fighting organizations, maybe the most well known of which is Pancrase. Pancrase is coming back, by the way. Uh, Pancrase, like the Japanese Pancrase organization just went to MMA, but um, the old school Pancrase rules, uh, we're getting it back here in the US, uh, headed up by Guy Mesger. So that, that should be exciting. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. And because of the Japanese shoot fighting and what we see is the Valle Tudo stuff down in Brazil, that stuff started laying the groundwork for what we call modern MMA. People wanted to do more than just wrestling, they wanted full on striking with it as well. And so really, we have all of this. We have this one dude that basically ruined boxing to thank for modern MMA. And the funny thing is, you know, growing up as a kid, you know, when I was, when I was doing Kempo, uh, and I was just, you know, I was just a karate kid in a, in a small town, and I was you know, watching pro wrestling, I was like, I would love to be able to do pro wrestling for real, but like real fighting. Back then, I didn't, I didn't know about Pancrase. And now I'm looking at it going, man, right? Pancrase is pro wrestling for real. Now, obviously some of the more spectacular stuff doesn't get pulled off and, and some of the more spectacular stuff isn't even possible or feasible in a real match. But the fact is, that that offered something that even actually like modern MMA doesn't doesn't really offer. And in, in the sense that the, the striking is a little more limited, it highlights the grappling a little bit more, but it keeps the grappling honest because they're striking, right? And so like if you wanna if you wanna play pro wrestling for real, right, you gotta think in terms of like old school pancreas, old school shoot fighting. Where yeah, maybe the, the striking is somewhat limited, but it's there to keep your grappling honest. Because if you can't grapple versus somebody striking you, your grappling's not all worth all that much. And that goes back to what we were talking about, wrestling for play or wrestling in earnest. Wrestling in earnest was always in the context of striking and weapons. And now granted, you know, Pancrase isn't in the context of weapons, but the idea is that when striking is on the table, when weapons are on the table, it, it keeps your grappling a little bit more honest. And I think that is a really important concept to keep hold of. Not that, not that pure grappling competitions are bad, right? I mean, pure grappling goes back forever. And those are great dominance games, and it's a way to compete and have fun and, and apply strength and conditioning uh, against somebody else without as much risk for serious injury and long-term brain damage as there is in striking. So I, I'm not saying pure play grappling should go away. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is that I think that keeping the striking in there, it makes it a little bit more honest. And by keeping the striking somewhat semi-limited, uh, makes it so that it still allows you to highlight the grappling and encourages more grappling than striking. And I think that's a good balance, right? So I'm not saying get rid of MMA. What I'm saying is have MMA and then kind of as a bookend over here, let's have this kind of old school pancrase, old school shoot fighting kind of method, this old school pro wrestling where you have limited striking and highlighted full submission grappling. Um, and I even think pins are okay. Maybe pins should be accompanied by strikes rather than just a hold down. Um, and in, in, in this sense, I, I, I actually like judo's pins better than uh, wrestling pins in the sense that you have to hold somebody down for 10 or 20 seconds, depending on the context, as opposed to an instantaneous pin or, or a, three, a, a three count. I think a three count is too short and doesn't really prove anything. A 10 second may still not prove anything, but it, it gets you a lot further. And hell, you know, if you really want to make it real exciting, make it best of three, right? 
uh, or that you have to, to accrue three to win, whatever. I think, you know, like a, like a three knockdown rule, um, which has pretty much gone away from boxing, but, you know, but the old three, three knockdown for a TKO, uh, three pins or something like that, I think would make a little more sense. But that's kind of where we're coming from here, right? So catch wrestling gave birth to all of this. And if we really want to keep our grappling honest, Let's put it in that, that, that old school shoot fighting format. Let's, let's keep the pins and submissions. Let's allow limited striking, right? I mean, you could go straight to MMA. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you want to really highlight the grappling, grappling if you really love the grappling, maybe go towards more something like this. And I, I think uh, that that will absolutely help out uh, keeping your grappling honest. And the fact that, that the, the old rules pan craze is coming back and coming here to the US this year uh, is just all kinds of exciting. So, uh, you know, best of luck to Guy Mesger and, uh, you know, in this new leg of pan um, But yeah, let's play pro wrestling for real. Talk to you guys later. Good journey. Thanks for watching. Like, subscribe, share, give the dog a bone. You can follow us on our other social media accounts. And if you really like it, you can head over to Amazon and buy a shirt. You can also go over to Gumroad and purchase some of our instructional courses. All of the links will be provided and also on our website. If you happen to be in the Phoenix area, we would love to meet you. Come drop in for a class, you know, even just to chat. And if you're looking for a new home, we would be happy to have you. So until next time, good journey.